Yeah. Okay, here we are. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you in our, our third series of our, Unsmart, our Smart Cities events. And this time we are exploring Unsmart Cities and actually ideas and applications of technology that are A, bottom up. Uh, they are, if you like, small scale. So we're looking at applications of Smart City technologies that benefit our everyday life. So we are looking away from models of big corporations like IBM, Samsung, can you stop my presentation? And uh, the, the kind of uh, big applications, as I said, of technology. And we're looking at ways that we can improve our everyday life. Here I have a very small PowerPoint presentation that James here will find it in a minute. Yes. Uh, while he's looking, can I just tell you some, something uh, that hopefully you can help us out with? After the last event on uh, surveillance and oversight of surveillance, we got invited to House of Commons to run a debate on the 23rd of March uh, on those topics. So if anybody is interested in helping out with structuring it and making it amazing, uh, talk to me after. It's 23rd of March, it will be in House of Commons. Thank you. Thank you, which is very, really very exciting. And if you would like, you can visit our website and read our open letter from the digital pioneers to the digital natives. So if you're interested and you would like to get involved more. Now, here I have, as I said, a very small presentation just to speak about what I mean about big corporations. So the applications of smart cities technologies that we've seen so far is here I have Rio, the Rio surveillance wall that we all know very much. Uh, we have cities like Sokonda in South Korea, which gives us the promise of the future. But if you like, the critique there is that those kinds of cities are more about power and class and, and social um, uh, discrimination rather than the future of technologies. Uh, here I have a, a slide from an artist uh, from Nairobi that uh, uh, gave coverings for roofs on the slums of Nairobi. We have this grand narrative so of uh, manuals for smart cities. And here I have personalized uh, my slide. Here is one, me uh, in a traffic violation, right? Which is automatically delivered uh, to my house. And this is obviously a smart city application. And the critique there is that most of the smart cities applications that we have so far are more about profit-making aims than bettering our everyday life. Here is a project that we did with Cyber Salon and it was run by Hackney Council. So Hackney Council actually offered particular data sets for developers, practitioners to develop and we did a kind of mobile phone app uh, for the hidden treasures of Hackney and we cooperated with Wikipedia. So this is what our event is uh, about today, that we are exploring, as I said, bottom-up approaches, moving away from the narrative of the big corporations. We have a really exciting panel of speakers, um, which I am introducing now. So, Rick Robinson uh, will discuss um, He's an art, IT architect, architect, so he will discuss examples of current applications of smart cities technologies in Birmingham and in other places. Um, Priya Prakash is a creative who uh, designs for Design for Social Change, is the uh, platform, yeah? And, um, sorry. Changeify is the platform, and Design for Social Change is the company. Uh, Rick Rosen is the author of Off the Grid, and he will also discuss smart grids. I don't know if you're aware of the argument of electricity, where we can have a model where you give in electricity as much as you take back. Uh, we have uh, Jodit Stanton. Who are they? Where are they? They're here. Who is going to discuss uh, smart sensors and applications of smart, smart sensors in the city. And we also have Carl Smith who will discuss 
other examples of smart cities in Japan and other places? Well, you will get to see. Um, just a reminder, uh, we, are, uh, we have a big presence on social media, so do please use our handler, Cyber Salon. If you want to pose questions in between the speakers, I will ask you to use the handler Cyber Salon Q, and then at the end of the presentations, we will take questions from our Twitter wall. And before I pass it on to our first speaker, we have one video that relates to the presentation that we have outside. And I will let the video speak for itself. Yes, the sound, I know. Panic spread throughout New York State, injuring hundreds, 11 people. In the summer of 2003, the lights went out for 55 million Americans across the Northeast. Panic spread throughout New York State, injuring hundreds, 11 people died in the dark. What was to blame? A small vulnerability inside the state's transmission control room. Raymond Kenny, a disgruntled employee, unleashed a virus and walked away. Four hours later, the system overloaded and the grid shut down. Ten years on, modern systems have advanced exponentially. 2011 marked the installation of America's first central operating system. CTOS is a computer software that manages entire cities, providing centralized control over subway lines, traffic lights, surveillance cameras, and electricity grids. A computer now controls a major city, but who controls the computer? The answer is private companies that have everything to gain from a CTOS. Personal data collection is the key commodity. You are no longer an individual. You are a data cluster bound to a vast global network. Last year, the average American cast a digital shadow of over 2.3 gigabytes. What does that represent? Of course, there are credit cards, medical records, and reading habits, but a CTOS includes much more. Massive data silos track and sort every moment of your digital life, revealing how you think and what you believe. That information could be turned against you, not just to sell products, but to influence your world views. CTOS directly links your personal information to the physical systems you use every day, essentially providing a direct line to your bedroom laptop. Because all data is interconnected, from Nigerian email scams to hardcore pornography, online shopping to emergency services, it's all part of the same network. Ten years ago, one man shut down the entire Northeast from a central control room. Today, everything can be hacked. No one knows what part of the system will be exploited, but everyone agrees the next assault will do more than just turn out the lights. Okay, I think that video perfectly summarizes what the event is about today. So how can we have applications with open source, open data, and as I say, how can we better our everyday life with applications of uh, everyday, in our everyday life? So with that, I am going to pass it over to Rick Robinson, who is going to be our first speaker. Don't forget to tweet, don't forget to post your questions on the Cyber Salon Q handler, and I will pass it on to Rick Robinson. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay like this? Over the back? Okay. So um, until six weeks ago, I worked for IBM as the technology lead for smart cities in the UK. So some of my colleagues were out in Rio building um, the example that you just saw, um, been involved in several similar things. Um, I moved to Amy six weeks ago, who some of you will know, some of you don't. Um, they're a huge provider of regulated services in the UK. So we collect bins, we clean parks, we maintain roads, we design airports, we install smart, smart meters. Um, what I've 
tried to put into this is just a little bit of a personal journey I've been on for the past eight years or so as I turned from a technology expert who worked for banks and telcos into a technologist working in cities, trying to unpick some of the challenges that I think we, we've just heard about and trying to understand how the large, very formal institutions with the resources and the authority over parts of cities can actually behave in a way that's conducive towards small-scale um, innovation and towards better lives for, for everyone. Um, so that's what I'll, I'll try and give you a flavour of. Um, and just as a sort of insight into the level of change that I think we're having to deal with at the moment and where we do that, um, I was minded a, a couple of years ago on the way walking through London to give a similar talk to this one. Um, I passed through uh, Wardour Street um, on my way to Oxford Street, past this little alleyway called St Anne's Court here. Um, it's brought back huge memories because 30 years ago I used to visit St Anne's Court, spending all the money I weren't uh, washing pots in a local restaurant, getting train tickets up to St Anne's Court to visit this little basement shop um, that you see in a picture here. Now I'll ask, does anyone in this room understand the significance of St Anne's Court to the music industry in the 1980s? <laughs> One person has, has ever known the answer to that question. It was the only place in the country you could buy really cutting edge death metal. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, Celtic Frost at the time was 17-year-olds practicing in a disused military bunker in Zurich. The story about how in a pre-internet world those three kids found the handful of people around Europe who, like me, were willing to spend money on music like that is ancient history today. It's changed out of all recognition. It's just absolutely astonishing. And then we get to this. Four years ago, my then two-year-old son taught himself how to use an iPad without anyone else showing him what to do. I watched it happen. I was working from home on my laptop. He was <laughs> needing some distraction. Gave him the laptop with a Thomas the Tank Engine video on and he watched it. At the end, he pressed the thumbnail of the one he wanted to watch next. I, I think there is something utterly fundamental about that. His expectation of the world is going to be completely different from any of us, from any of the 18, 20 year olds who grew up with social media. Having data at your fingertips, being able to mani manipulate it like that. And, and this is already clunky, out of date tech. About three years ago, scientists at the University of Berkeley in California used an MRI scanner to capture moving images from the brain waves created by a person inside the scanner watching a film on a pair of digital goggles. Um, a year after that, two scientists at the University of Washington used similar non invasive technology to allow one of them to move the other one's arm just by thinking about it. Now, um, these are incredibly powerful capabilities. When you think about, you know, our world's been transformed by the ease with which we can access information. Um, that ease used to be limited by telephone internet connections, by keyboards like this one. It's now limited by touch screens, and soon those boundaries will just disappear. It does, of course, also bring really serious ethical and privacy um, considerations. And we've just seen a video about what might happen if we don't take those things very seriously. So I think there are these great capabilities, um, but great challenges with this as well. And when I started thinking about all of these things in my job now to design technology solutions for cities, I was reminded of this picture, which I saw as a student at the university in Birmingham um, in the 1990s. Um, this is Mass House Circus, famous part of Birmingham's inner city ring road. It was built in the post-war decades because everybody knew Birmingham needed first-class road connections to the national economy in order for its economy to boom. Look at the top right, the McLaren building and the other high-rise buildings in the city centre built as high as you can because land is most valuable there. Then look just across the road at this huge area that's left as a flat car park that we didn't even build a second story on because land is so unvaluable there. Why is that? Because people can't walk across that roundabout. Um, it, abs absolutely the case. We were just talking um, bef before over drinks about a study of fuel poverty in Glasgow that links Glasgow's terrible discrepancy in life expectancy. If you're a baby boy born today in the poorest part of Glasgow, you'll die on average 28 years younger than a baby boy born today in the richest part of Glasgow. And when a study looked into why that terrible disparity exists it comes back to people in the poor parts of Glasgow don't like exercising because they don't feel safe when they go out of doors it comes back down to do I want to walk down that road or not
Now, this is all urban design, and I've talked to a lot of urban designers and architects over the last, um, last eight years or so, and there's been a lot of great thinking in that area now about how we do better than this. People like Jan Gale, who created the Human Scale Cities Movement, and Kelvin Campbell, who asked the question, what are the characteristics of urban environments and policies that give rise to massive amounts of small-scale innovation? So really sophisticated, exciting ideas. And what this led me to thinking was we have those same challenges with technology infrastructures in cities. You know, this isn't technology in the back room of corporations anymore running finance and HR. This is technology in every aspect of our lives. And if we don't get it right with data protection law that's way, way, way behind the state of the art of the possible um, these days, if we don't get it right, then we'll build the next generation of cities to be just as harmful as that generation was. So how can things look, look differently? This is... I um, saw an example of a hackathon before. This is a hackathon that IBM sponsored back when I worked for them in Birmingham a few years ago. This set of people sat around and asked, with the data available to us, the tools and skills available to us, how could we make Birmingham a better place? The 50 or so of us up there talked about a huge things, and then Uj Duty, who sat right at the back of the top photo, said, I went to this huge family wedding at the weekend, loads and loads of catered food everywhere, and at the end there was loads left over, we had to throw it away. Surely there was something better we could do with all that food. And so these fellows here um, then created an application over the weekend that captured information about as many professional kitchens and catering services in the area as possible and linked those up with as many soup kitchens and other organisations who try to give food out to people who don't have enough. And it's important that the first half is professional kitchens because that way it's produced in a certified environment so no one gets into trouble if you give it to someone else to eat and it's not going to turn out to have been cooked or prepared improperly. So that, that's a great idea, great innovation, great use of technology. But there's a challenge with it. Getting food from one place to another is a physical activity. You can't just do that with code. So how do you take great bottom-up innovations like this one and connect them with the resources that can actually make them do something? So this is how we, we did part of that. Part of that. So... About two, three years ago in Birmingham, where I live, more as a personal thing than a work thing, IBM was sending me three hours north to work in Sunderland and three hours south to work in Plymouth, and I thought, I really, really want a project closer to home. Um, so I started networking around Birmingham, ending up forming something called the Birmingham Smart City Alliance. Um, and you see these logos of all these companies, organisations, innovators like OpenStreetMaps. We come together every month to engage with new ideas about how to make Birmingham a better place. And our attitude isn't that we create grand policies and schemes. We've got no remit. We're just a group of people, really, who decided to come together. The council and the NEP set any remit for the region. We just listen to what's happening and find ways to support it. So we took the ideas from the hackathon and the food initiative. We gathered some unusual suspects, entrepreneurs that we knew, health specialists, the Chamber of Commerce who support small business, and we talked about where we might take things. And I'm enormously proud to say that as a result one of the nutritionists in that room got inspired to form the Harborn Food School which has taken two years of development now I think and all the members of the Smart City Alliance have participated in a process of helping them make connections, bid for grants, um, get the advice and mentoring that they need. It's just opening at the moment you can see the fantastic teaching environment they've got in here. This is not the same thing as the app not by any means, but what it is, is a scalable community interest company that can start to promote local food in Birmingham. So they're based in Harborn, which is a fairly affluent area. It means that a um, catering equipment manufacturer gave them all that equipment for free as a demonstration environment, and they're charging people a fair whack to come in to have courses taught by celebrity chefs. But they're also teaching local public sector catering services how to source better quality, more sustainable, more locally sourced food. And they're teaching people how to run small businesses. You know, this is an area of employment. And the more people running small businesses, creating food locally in Birmingham, the more people are likely to eat healthier. And when they get this sustainable business model going, then we've got critical mass to start thinking again about how we really implement that food sharing idea so that we can make a difference. So I haven't talked at all yet about Amy, who I'm now working for. Um, Amy are part of the Birmingham Smart City Alliance, and what I'm trying to do at Amy is follow these, these same sort of ideas. 
take the market imperatives that will drive smart data and technology into an organisation like Amy, because it means we can send the bin lorries where they need to be sent rather than just send them on the same route. We can send the grip bin fillers to the grip bins that are empty rather than just driving them around every, every county all the time. That creates a financial incentive for us to invest in platforms that have remote sensors and connectivity and data integration capabilities and visualisation and analytics. But of course, once we've got all this stuff, we've got this data, it then becomes useful for other purposes. So we're working with a county council at the moment to make our own services more efficient about this and put all the data in one place about the work that needs doing and the work that we're going to do. The next step is to talk about how we put that out as open data so that citizens, residents and businesses of the council can be informed. And the next step is to look at what can other organisations then do with that data. And now we've got a platform in place that can be built incrementally to do other things that aren't necessarily core business cases for us but that add value to our clients. So we're trying to find this middle road between the top-down market dynamics that will drive investment in technology but also supporting the local small-scale informal innovation that makes real places better. Um, I'm personally taking a lot of inspiration from some of the people I mentioned before, Kelvin Campbell and his, mass, his smart urbanism movement, um, Jan Gale and um, human scale cities and there's a reasonably deep analogy here I don't know how many people um, will, will know this in the room but when I started designing computer software in the 1980s I came across a tool called the design pattern this was a tool that allowed me to share knowledge from other skilled designers and design better more scalable more user, usable computer systems every time you select a menu option in any piece of software you're using a design pattern called a command who do you think invented the design pattern was a town planner called Christopher Alexander. Design patterns emerged from urban design and architecture and then spread into software engineering are probably behind about two thirds of the digital technology we all use every day. Um, the designers of the architects associated with that are now collaborating with the inventor of the wiki trying to build new design patterns for digital cities and I think there's a great cause of overlap there. Anyway, I hope that's given you some sort of idea of, of what I've been doing and some flavour of how I'm trying to join these top-down and bottom-up worlds so that we don't only create cities that are more resilient and efficient, but cities that give everyone a better, fairer chance at a happy, healthy life. Thank you. Hi there, um, I'm Nick Rosen, and I've um, written about off-grid living. And I don't really have an argument about smart cities so much as a few perceptions or ideas I wanted to put to you. Um, I uh, started teaching philosophy and then became a social scientist, worked on some of the early surveys, working out how do you measure the quality of life and then went into advertising and from there into journalism and documentary making and then started an internet company. And um, so I've, I've got a kind of, an, I was an early adopter of computing. And then um, about 10 years ago or, or so, kind of rather reacted against it and decided that I was a bit tired of, uh, of, um, being on the grid and uh, bought some land, you know, and went off and to just get away and have a digital detox. And so I've got perhaps an unwelcome note of scepticism about some of these ideas that Rick has put forward. Not that I'm opposed to them, but I just think that you know, they can be treated with a bit of caution. Um, I've written a couple of books, which I've got a couple of copies of, if anybody's interested. And I wanted to start with the headline from today's paper, um, suggesting, probably untruly, that we might have a gas crisis or an energy crisis in Europe over the next few days. But it's the sort of fear that um, makes us think about turning off grid, getting somewhere where you can grow your own food, power from hydro, possibly even build the house yourself and you know, just use wood fires. 
And it leads to the question, are we talking really about smart cities or resilient cities? Of course, they're not mutually exclusive, but where's our focus? And I, my first point would be that maybe we should be focusing on the idea of a resilient city that is able to withstand and you know, adapt and work around problems, whether they be traffic snarl-ups or you know, energy outages. And I was in New York, actually, um, for that great energy outage in 2003. And um, I don't remember it being a hacker. I, it's, where, it's actually why I got interested in off-grid. But I remember it being as a result of energy trading, that you know, so much of the energy that flows around the national grid in America is being traded between energy companies. And that, that was the, uh, the hiccup that caused it. Uh, so that's the first time I've heard that it was a, a hacker. Um, but however, wherever you live, you definitely want the lights on. And you definitely want um, to make use of the comforts of technology where you can. But as we've seen, their technology and the people who sell it to us have a habit of turning it to their advantage. And that is my main reservation about smart cities, is that although there are some quite useful things for us, the consumer, as Rick was pointing out, they're largely going to be organized by and be for the benefit of the producers. That was the experience with the building of the original grid, the electricity grid, we'll come on to that. So at the moment, I think we all accept that um, there is no such thing anymore as anonymity, that uh, almost everything about us is being quantified. And actually, Eva was asking for a bit of advice about the House of Commons we event next month. Mine would be um, to, um, to legislate as quickly as <laughs> possible. Like, yeah. Yes, yeah, smart interview dresses. Um. It's not me. Mine would be to legislate as quickly as possible about the vast amounts of our personal data, which are being held not by government, but by private companies. It's a point I made actually in the talk after the last event. And um, this huge amount of data, which is now being exploited really heavily by market research companies and advertising agencies, and utility companies and retail organizations um, is completely unregulated. And even if we were to bring in legislation tomorrow, uh, there would be nothing we could do about the data that's already held. And almost no way to kind of assert our ownership of our own data about ourselves. Um, so still on the background leading up to the argument here, um, just a few random things from last Sunday's papers. Smart cities will depend on the smart grid, and smart grids will depend on smart meters. And a smart Sunday Times journalist happened to notice that her new smart meter, uh, installed by British Gas, was producing rather a high bill. And you know, she just sensed it. She didn't know. She couldn't prove it. They told her she was crazy. It was a good little column in the paper last week. And in the end, she forced them to investigate, and they admitted that it was um, charging her 10% too much. I don't know how she noticed that. And they said it was the very first and only case they'd ever come across. And in the same paper, uh, sorry, in the Mail on Sunday, there was quite an interesting story about Tesco customers having their club cards hacked, and in each case being told that this was, you know, the first time anybody at Tesco's had heard of it. So this issue of us and our data and private companies to me is the is the the one thing that the smart city will not be able to it's the one argument that the smart city will not be able to overcome i think um, but there's no question that it is a huge market opportunity according to the market research company frost and sullivan it'll be worth 1.5 trillion by 2020 and that's 1.5 trillion to software companies, hardware companies, uh, management consultancies, um, health companies, technology companies, TV companies. And that word smart is a great marketing word. Do you remember get smart? You know, it was very futuristic and it's sort of meant to conjure up 
the idea of a uh, you know, of a um, you know a wonderful world just around the corner where all our problems will be dealt with by uh, technology, but of course it ain't going to happen. And um, according to Frost and Sullivan, the, the main focus of, of the smart city right now is going to remain the power grid, because of course energy is at the base of almost everything, everything else that we design. And one of my big concerns uh, when I was writing those books was to look at how the grids were built. And it was striking how they were designed entirely in the interests of the producers of energy. And they, you know, the entire um, structure of the energy industries that built up was created in order to encourage us to use more energy. And among the early pioneers, and that was General Electric in America, which um, pioneered that phrase, make your house a home, and um, bought up all the patents on light bulbs, secretly owned every single competing light bulb company, and uh, you know, gradually put the price up. But what was interesting about the early electricity industry is that originally the wealthy houses around Wall Street would pay per light bulb. They would pay a, a kind of weekly price for each light bulb. <clears throat> But that was quickly changed when Edison realized there was a better idea because it was in his, his, in his interest then, of course, to economize on the electricity he was producing and reduce the amount of energy each light bulb used. So he started charging per unit of electricity and then became in his interest to make light bulbs inefficient rather than efficient. And so that has set the business model for the industry ever since. And will, I suggest, set the business model for the uh, smart cities as well. So when it comes to the smart grid, which is supposed to underpin the smart city, um, you know, remember the story of the, the smart meter, which couldn't actually detect how much energy was really being used. The smart grid is um, being pushed in America by GE and over here by British Gas. And um, it's going to... Do you remember the electricity showrooms? Those who are old enough to remember them. There is, of course, somewhere called the electricity showroom still in Shoreditch. It's now a bar. But it used to be a place where you'd go to buy your electricity... Uh, you, um, fridges and cookers and that kind of thing. You know, all of which are notoriously inefficient. Um, but what's happened recently is that people have realized that there are quite a lot of shortcomings with the grid and that we don't actually necessarily need the grid anymore. If you were designing a new city from scratch, you might not actually have to bring in the grid, i.e. the national grid, because you might be able to use local energy and that's been um, generated locally and is consumed locally and then you wouldn't lose 30% of the power in the transmission of it around the country, and um, you would no longer need to cater to peak demand at some theoretical place somewhere outside your area, but be able to um, cater to your own actual energy needs. Um, so my argument against the smart grid, which uh, will be perhaps I can develop later, is that it's cementing into place a flawed system that was developed 100 years ago for some of the wrong reasons and which is notoriously inefficient. Um, and that uh, the smart grid will bring in privacy issues and it will also do something else quite important, which is that it will allow the differential pricing of electricity um, at times of peak demand. So everybody knows the famous story about how when the you know when the half time in the World Cup everybody puts on the kettle and the uh, energy industry is poised to increase production at that particular time, and what will happen once the smart grid is in place is that those times of peak consumption will be the times of peak pricing, and that's fine if you're wealthy. But if you're a poor person who perhaps depends on 
you know, if you're, let's say, elderly and poor and you need your heating, then uh, those times of peak pricing will be times when you have to turn off your heater or when even, you know, the smart grid will turn off your heater for you. And uh, that makes me think that maybe the smart city will be a wealthy city and will work on behalf of the wealthy rather than the majority. As well as I said that there are privacy issues I already dealt with. Um, so all over the world, but it could just as well work in this country, uh, people are turning to microgrids. And this is grids where you're generating and providing energy for a small local area. Microgrids can talk to each other, of course, and uh, so, so you know you can build up a larger grid from microgrids. But the idea is that they're owned and controlled locally, and that um, in these days of um, of information flow, a grid that charges your phone and manages your lighting could be enough because your other heavier uses of energy could be catered for much more locally. Um, Frost and Sullivan identified some other obstacles in the way of smart cities and I think that in summary um, the smart city might be a panacea which the governments can regulate to ensure that the poor and the elderly and the weaker in society don't do, do still benefit from it or it might lead us to withdraw entirely from digital life. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Priya, do you want to... While we're having just a small tech change in the computer, may I remind everyone to be tweeting their questions while they're warm from their speakers and we will address them after previous uh, talk. So keep on your questions. I'm sure they're interesting and exciting and we will hear them uh, in just a little while. I'm just curious about bottom up and top down. So, how many of you guys have actually uh, signed an email petition? Hands up in the air. Come on, guys. You're invested. Only so many? Hmm. How many of you guys have liked a Facebook article about you know improving your city or something about your local issue? Okay. How many of you guys have actually started something in your neighborhood to do something about some issue? Okay, interesting. All right, just want to see how bottom up we are here. Cool. So starting swiftly on, if something plays. I could just do this without slides as well, but. Don't need to uh, bash Max up. Okay, so hi, I'm Priya, and I'm from Design for Social Change, which is the name of my design studio. Uh, when I left Nokia, I had this moment of, um, I love teenage engineering, sorry, this is a bit geeky, but it's a company which does amazing electronic products. So one day when I was working in Nokia, I said, I want to change the world, I want to do something, I'm going to start a studio called Design for Social Change. So that's the story behind the, the big idealistic or big hairy audacious uh, goal that we all have. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about some projects because last time uh, Eva very kindly invited me for the Cyber Salon and I was talking about a platform we had started called Changeify and I just want to talk a bit about share my process because as a person I love complaining as well about things that don't work well. But as a designer I like to build stuff so I don't complain. So I like to prototype my complaint into something that hopefully some people will use. So that's my story and playing seriously I, I, I want us all to engage in a, in a way of thinking which is, you know, 
it's all very nice to be doom and gloom, uh, gloom. I've worked with people like Adam Greenfield and Dan Hill. You know, we all can talk a lot about bad things, about data and privacy and smart cities. I'm a bit bored of that, to be honest. And I had enough. I has quit complaining and do something. Get, out, get off your ass and start writing, you know, all this stuff and actually build some bloody tools so people can start figuring out how to do something about this. So that's where I'm coming from and I will swear occasionally because I had a glass of wine. So, um, actually I normally swear while talking. I've been told several times. So we are the design for social change is data plus action equals change. And by action, I just don't mean like, you know, pressing the like on Facebook and slacktivism. I mean getting out there, going on the street and just doing some stuff. And it doesn't have to be big. You don't have to be part of Occupy Movement or something. You can just go for a walk in your neighborhood and figure out what's happening around you. This usual gump, we work with different people, so we're not just social enterprise. We work with a lot of technology companies. And this is my background. I used to design operating systems before. Uh, three operating systems for a company called Nokia. Two, one of them got canceled, got like, you know, existential crisis, decided to leave. And what was nice about that is, <laughs> I said this before, once you design an operating system, it's a bit like zombies, you can see operating systems everywhere. So every time I should come back from my visits, meeting my engineering teams in Finland and in Germany, I would come back to my city, see lots of things not working, and it's felt exactly like the stack. You have the, you know, the experience layer, you have the service layer with the tube, and then you have the infrastructure layer, which also is quite similar to some of the things that Dr. Rick was talking about earlier in terms of the smart city stack. So we have a toolkit, which I'm not going to talk too much about, but we've been doing various kind of offline, online interventions. I don't believe actually anymore on digital or online or offline. I think it's a continuum, just like you have your conversation. You guys are tweeting, you're probably, you know, talking stuff about me, it's like, <laughs> whatever. But it's a conversation, right? Do I care on Twitter? No. Do I care that we're having a face-to-face -face conversation? Yes. I mean, this is a continuum. And I think if you stop getting, you know, annoyed that something's happening offline or online, it's a continuous journey. And this is why my toolkit has got like physical stuff and offline stuff and at the same time uh, we've done things like you know loyalty schemes because we're really interested in the business model we prototype things like 3d printed custom stencils for neighborhoods so people can actually create something that is specific to their neighborhood and put a postcard out there so they can see how they would like to change their neighborhood by having something physical they can put on their mantelpiece We've created something called Citizen Canvas, which is inspired from the business model canvas, because I also like to innovate on the process. I found it very hard, just like uh, Dr. Rick said earlier, when you go into the smart city projects, especially if you're a self-funded person, you just go into meeting after meeting with lots of suits. And what happens is you need to collaborate with all these people, and it's extremely hard. So as a designer or a developer, I thought what we need to do is create better collaboration between all these different people and really track where the data is being, go, uh, is being asked because normally we always see data being taken but not data being offered. And this is actually what Joe Thorpe mentioned today in uh, Future Everything in Manchester. So I've used my neighborhood as a lab to prototype this. I live in Camberwell, I love Camberwell. And uh, before trying to change the neighborhood, what I realized is there are people, a lot of people actually don't know whether they like their neighborhood. They want to escape it. They probably want to come to Shoreditch. But <laughs> a lot of people actually need some time to get accustomed to the fact that they also enjoy being in their neighborhood. So we did projects where we used to work with, the, I used to be in the farmer's market every Saturday and work with my local community group just to explore what it felt like for people to, to say that yes, they like their neighborhood and create small campaigns using Facebook and Twitter and capture this because we were trying to help local businesses to either sell more produce in the farmer's market. These were all little prototypes to kind of find out how people start identifying themselves with their neighborhood. We've done pilots with our platform and our walks in different cities, so I can go about that a bit later. But today what we're talking about, given what Eva has put forward as a topic, is the unsmart city. And this is actually a year ago from The Guardian, which talks about mayors putting the wrong things at the heart of smart cities. Am I speaking too fast? Yes? Hands up, yes? Okay, cool. See, user-friendly. I'll go slow. I'm an Indian as well, used to speaking fast. So, pause. <laughs> anyway, um, so stupid mayors are putting the wrong things at the heart of smart cities. And what was interesting here was that the residents are not getting the right tools. And this really annoys me, is that citizens don't have the right tools. And what I mean by tool is not a reporting application like Fix My Street, where you just report something. It's a tool where you are an active participant, 
and you can shape the neighborhood around you besides just commenting. It's about using your data, using your activity as an active co-creator, as a part of shaping your neighborhood, instead of just going inside a consultation process when a new building comes up in your neighborhood. And I find this quite odd that not many people are actually actively tapping on our intelligence of all of, pe all of us sitting around here, or people in a space who are using that place every day. And that's the thing that which I want to talk about today. And the problem why we need to engage is, we've all heard about the smart city, Rara, about how big this market is. We've also heard from Nick earlier about some of the backlash from the smart meters as well. And also the smart citizen movement, which is taking off, where a lot of people have huge trust issues on what's actually happening with their data. And I think it's fair enough because we haven't made it easier. I mean, how, long, how many of you have actually re read the end user license agreement for Facebook? Interesting, three people. Now imagine if there's gonna be an end user license agreement on your, on your toothbrush. Are you gonna start reading the email on your toothbrush? Because it's gonna start capturing the data? No, because life's too short. You've got other things. You want to go to work. You need to brush your teeth and go away. And I think this is the scary part. As designers, we are designing this stuff. And I think there is a certain responsibility there of what we are designing and putting out. And I, I really believe that we have to create a better transparency on how. It's not about scaring people that your data is going to be used willy-nilly. It's about trying to make it clear how your data is being captured, where it's going to be applied, and how you can have control on it going forward. So what I'm proposing is that we re-look at the kind of current architecture model. And you know, again, Dr. Okan have had some discussions on this. So this is the old smart city model, which is where IBM and you know, Cisco and many people get bashed up. This is the popular anti-smart city model, which is the distributed bottom-up Ethiopia. And I don't think either of these models are, you know, are sufficient for the kind of issues that Nick is talking about, which is a resilient city. Let's not get romantic here. Let's not just think that, you know, by everybody in a local, hyper-local way, having done this, again, thanks for Eva for the opportunity, having done this using my own neighborhood as a lab, I don't believe pure bottom-up alone. In the current situation, we are in a transition phase. As a city, as a civilization where things are becoming smart, we need to harness both the centralized model as well as the distributed model. And what I'm proposing, and I don't have a clever word, so if anybody is good in language, please help me here, is find out a way where you bring the centralized and distributed model together. And this is something that Dan Hill and I was discussing as well recently, is that this, there seems to be a lack in thinking on how we can take the best of what we've been having through the kind of centralized system that city already has a lot of data, and how can we bring much more of this participation? So what's that sweet spot? I don't know. And that's why we're here to find out. Sorry? Holism. 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 Sorry, what's the word? Holism. 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 Oh, hol oh, nice, cool, holism. Interesting. Yay, that's that. We should try that. Can people tweet that? Do they like that so we can find out? Holism, a holistic um, architectural model. Cool, thank you. This is a good uh, conversation, Eva. Cheers. Uh, <laughs> you get all my homework done here tonight. Crowdsourced. <laughs> Change of our projects, just a quick sense of what we've been doing. So we did this project um, uh, with our local post office in Camberwell. Uh, we got a grant to f figure out how to rethink about the post office. So this is just to show you some quick um, projects about bottom up. So a uh, Camberwell post office was in a dire situation. We got 10,000 pounds from the post office uh, uh, fund to see how we could um, rethink both as a public and a, uh, a kind of public space as well as a digital space and a private space. So we work with Goldman Dicing, which is a local artist group, to kind of uh, crowdsource exactly like what we did tonight, uh, various kind of comments what people felt about the post office and celebrate that as the mural. So if you are local to Southeast London, have a look at the Campbell. Who's, who's from Campbell around passes by the post office? Have you guys seen this? Okay, have a go, go in, they're much nicer now. Go and have a look at the post office. And we got covered by the IBM for uh, the people for Smarter Cities project, which was quite funny, because it kind of come, came to a full circle. Um, this is a project I'm gonna talk about a bit later. This is actually a project we're hoping to do with, uh, together with uh, Rick's team. So we won the Connected Cities Innovation Contest where we're going to be working um, with Amy on figuring out how we can use real-time 
um, cyclist intelligence to improve the road infrastructure. So I'm a big fan of Fraggle Rock. Who likes Fraggle Rock? Yay, everybody's heard of Fraggle Rock, right? No? Come on, guys, Fraggle Rock. I mean, I'm from India, so we have that in our, it was the only child TV show that I used to love. So I love the doozers. And I always wanted to work with a company which, you know, I could really like, you know, work with the doozers. And for me, I'm sorry, this is not meant to be Amy, but the doozers are the people who really manage the road infrastructure, the highway maintenance. So this project is my dedication to the doozers who are really kind of keeping our cities up and going. So I will talk about that a bit later. We've been doing uh, lots of uh, different kind of collabs, which we're calling it as uh, citizen collabs, where we run a space in a neighborhood and invite people on different kind of workshops where they either map their local network connections and at the same time also come up with various new ways in which they would like to change a neighborhood. And this is a short film around that. This is in Hamburg. So we pretty much go on the work. So this is just a step-by-step -step recipe or design pattern on how to do this. Should you fancy doing this in your own neighborhood? And you observe what's happening. You can automatically see some problems in cyclists and motorists. This is up in front of the ice. And they have a bit of war of words in German, which I can't follow. And we give people chalk, which is very high tech, so they can add their comments on the street on things they like. And we also meet other uh, projects or people who are doing interesting stuff in a bottom up way. So this guy is selling tomatoes in the farmer's market. Apparently in Germany it's illegal to sell organic tomatoes which are not standardized. And this guy was doing gold of tomatoes, which is quite funny. And when we come back, and map these insights that you've seen in a space. And again, all this stuff is paper and post-it notes, nothing rocket science, no high tech yet. This is not a space, this is a parking lot outside. And it could be a space again. And right now it's not. People interview each other and try to see whether they can group up on creating a project together. And we have this tool with us called the Citizen Canvas where they fill up things to come up with an idea. And they create short videos, just like on Kickstarter, to talk about the ideas to get backed by local businesses. And then we have a little pitch um, event at the end of the day where they present this to front of local businesses or the council or other companies who are interested to support ground up it projects. It's great to see all the projects that are here in Shanse, which is basically our neighborhood, but sometimes you don't even take the time or the depth to get to know the people behind the projects. It's a very interesting workshop because it combines different ideas from different backgrounds of people and professions. My goal is obviously it's always best to get out of the office and you know so you can see this online and I'm gonna go whatever it might be you have go to forward because we don't have much time so we've done this and we've also done the project like I said the citizen canvas where we have people in the workshop they identify what role they are going to take in a smart city project and we've also had this uh, display shared this at the smart city plaza and we prototyped this through various kind of things working with London School of Economics in Hamburg in Sheffield and we brought it to the plaza and I just wanted to show this, share this short film at the Smart City World Expo which happened in Barcelona last year in November. So when you talk about where people are, this is what's happening. So you can see the language already and I'm very interested in vocabulary so thanks for the whole stick again but you know, just look at the words that are being used. It's quite utopic again, and there's lots of drones flying around. You'll come across that. And there's some good projects as well. But I think there's, there's a very la lack of people, or people-centric solutions there. Even though people are talking about people, you can't see them. 
So I'm going to move on. That's, that film is also available online. So one of the things which I'm very passionate about is actually all the stuff that we're doing. How does this get disseminated and how do people apply this on a practical level? So we're doing these things from a grassroots, giving this toolkit to citizens, but also from an education perspective. So I've just kind of partnered up with the Syracuse University to come up with this course called If Londoners Designed a Smarter London. And my students are now taking four neighborhoods, which is Kilburn, Brixton, Camden, and Rotherite as a neighborhood collab to try some of these methods because we've been doing this pretty much very rapidly and now we'd like to work with other universities to try this out and see whether this can be part of your education itself. And this is a story. So I started Changeify because I was a cyclist and I wrote this letter to my counselor saying I want to do something about this besides just use fix my street or complain or come together with other cyclists. Nothing happened, you know, put it on Facebook, Twitter as usual, got support, started the platform. And then, you know, a lot of things happened. I, I kept continuing this whole conversation on Twitter as well as through the council meetings following that particular report. And I think of just sharing that this has come to full circle because I have two ghost bikes outside my, my own road on, Ca on Camberwell Road. And I tried to raise awareness as well about this by dressing up as a ghost bike on last Halloween. And you know, really said, okay, I'm gonna solve this particular problem. And so this is the project I'm looking to work with Rick together with my doozers. So please sign up for a trial and I'll probably um, leave you with that because I think I've run out of time. So you're going to see this in a city. We're still figuring out which city it's going to come up in, but it's going to be around. We're going to be doing a campaign. And even though it starts with uh, taking photos of road issues initially, you'll be asked to vote on those things and also see nearby issues. And that gets targeted to other people nearby. people vote on that. At the same time, local businesses can decide to support an issue because they can see it trending. And the councillor gets a notification, it's useful because elections are coming up. Uh, this becomes a data project. You can decide to troubleshoot a particular part of the infrastructure, earn points, which are supported by local businesses. And this part is my favorite part, so that any workman can have a photo taken um, at the end of it and do a selfie with, um, with uh, the fixed issue and that's how I get the karma back of the human infrastructure. But I'm not going to go through all this stuff. We are, uh, we are actually working with British Standard Institute as well to create a new standard for citizen feedback. So again, I think from a very systems point of view, how does this stuff actually get used? So I'd love to speak to people who are interested in standards, because that's again another hairy topic. So thank you. I'm going to leave you with this, which is I love starlings and talking about bottom up and top down. And I said there's two different systems. So you know we can have this idea of flocking behaviors and all our actions coming together to do something. So these are starlings. It's, it's a beautiful image, but what's interesting is these guys, so this is a fantastic image. When starlings were faced with a falcon, they came together and took a shape of a huge falcon and scared the falcon off. So this is what I believe in the end. If you think about it from a technical architecture, the last version of this in the transition phase is actually all that little data, all our little actions in the end can be a huge interesting system, which is real time. Thank you. Thank you, that was really excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, no, that's all right. Just to allow enough time for questions at the end, we are gonna have our two next speakers. So, uh, your distantant will be next, and then Carl, and then we'll open it up for questions, because I think there are really interesting arguments here, and we're getting a flavor from all the sides of the argument of smart cities. So uh, think about your contributions, and we'll look forward to hearing them at the end. Hi everyone, um, my name is Yorit. I run a tiny startup called Open Sensors IO. I'm a, a software engineer by trade. Um, I spent, God knows, uh, about 15 years uh, building trading systems for, for banking. 
Um, and now for, for kind of my sins, I run a startup um, and, and, and kind of paying back to society. We're incubated in the Open Data Institute. So um, we basically create uh, software and, and platforms for, for uh, internet things. So just as a uh, quick introduction around open data, the Open Data Institute was uh, created, uh, founded by uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee uh, about two years ago. Um, inventor of the web, and, and, or founder of the web. Uh, and really what it's about is, is creating um, a kind of a valid way to, to enable uh, governments, businesses to share data. Um, open data is really about data in the public sphere. Um, usually it's paid for by us, by the taxpayers. Uh, governments hold, uh, central government holds open data uh, or, or data. Uh, the NHS does, and anything that is uh, should be in the public sphere should be out there. Uh, people, there are many, many businesses now popping up, uh, creating services around open data. There are startups like Spend Network that take procurement data and make it accessible. Uh, so if you want to know about, uh, you know, a particular government department and how they spend their money, you can go and find it in an easy way. Um, so really. What it is, 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 is doing a, co a kind of creating a commons around all of the data that's generated by governments and, and there should be an element of transparency and also an element of reuse, which is very, very important. I mean, we all kind of have talked about the fact that um, cities, governments, organisations are, are creating um, and creating a lot of data that's not going to go away. Um, but really, can we make this accessible and reusable? Um, and what we do is we, we are creating open data around, uh, well, centres and smart cities. Um, the, the kind of, um, who has actually heard of, of the Internet of Things? I mean, should I kind of, right, right, great, okay, great, so I So I don't, I don't have to kind of, I don't have to explain. It's, it's connected devices. Uh, it could be anything. It could be uh, in kind of air quality monitors, uh, parking, and everything else. And, and by, I mean, the kind of the, the, the figure that's banded around is 20 billion new uh, devices connected in, in the next five years, which is kind of scary. So if we talk about the <laughs> context of scale, that's, you know, daily messages uh, that are going to be created, uh, 333 times more, uh, like more messages than Twitter, and, and 94 times uh, the size of WhatsApp. And many of these messages are going to be uh, in the public space, uh, parking centres, air quality monitors, all sorts. London has 500,000 parking uh, spaces. Um, I suspect there are, there are a good few companies that we're working with that are having a go at putting parking sensors in each one of them. And um, what are we going to do with all this data is, is the question. And, and quite, quite, I think, interesting things are going to happen. I mean, the, the next... Uh, Google is not going to be a search company. The next Facebook is not going to be a social network. There are real tangible problems um, that can be solved with with connected devices in, in some shape. And I think they could actually make um, the lives of, of people better. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you some examples of projects that we've worked in. We have, we did some uh, connected, we helped a university um, monitor REM sleep in elderly people uh, in a European funded project about 18 months ago. And from that, what came out was that if you monitor REM sleep, um, if you discount accidents such as falls, um, so emergency room admissions, um, you, can, you can pretty much predict by the interruption of REM sleep three days before that somebody is, is, is admitted to hospital. So uh, there is a very kind of very definite marker. What could this do for the NHS? I have I have no idea. The mind kind of boggles. Uh, bigger studies are are being done and and, and recent kind of papers are being published. And I think this is really fascinating. And whilst the kind of there is that scary side of of all this data being collected, I think there is that we we sometimes forget the real benefit that we can kind of make to 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 people. Uh, you know, people. Um, recover better at home than in hospital. If you can have a really kind of um, a nice, a nice way of, of kind of having has hands off 
uh, monitoring that is not creepy and that they choose. I mean, people should be able to choose the kind of the level of monitoring that they have. People fall um, in their homes all the time. It's a very scary thing. So I think the lack of kind of not making these systems uh, available is, n is not really the kind of the right way. It's just giving people a choice of, of, of uh, uh, kind of applications. And, and each individual should be able to choose what level of monitoring that they will accept. Um, and, and not kind of enforce it one way or the other. Um, so this is what we're kind of doing. I, the people that, just to say we're a company, people pay us, uh, people pay us for privacy. We don't sell private data. Uh, there are a lot of startups creating connected products uh, with us and, and they pay us for privacy. But really what we're trying to do is create a commons, a real-time commons around um, data. We have some thousands of people that are publishing and subscribing to uh, data from the public space. So this is parking data. Um, so you can ingest data from you know from from devices. You can plug it. I mean, you can subscribe and and filter the data uh, the data that you have. This is all published with an open data license. That means that you can reuse it. You can make money on it. Um, and really, I think this hopefully is is the way that we will move forward in in kind of the. I hate the word smart cities, but whatever we're building, I think there is, there is a sense that with the web, the web became the web when we actually, everyone was able to either create businesses or create um, systems and, and, and we never, we kind of, when we stopped building these silos and, and, and kind of walled gardens, um, the web exploded and I don't think we will even know in um, a few years time what we're going to make of this IoT thing. Um, somebody's going to come up and it will seem really obvious um, in, in two years that this particular service should have existed, but we don't know. And, and enabling people to create services for local authorities and, and, and people um, seems, seems to make sense. Um, we, um, and so I kind of, I have, I have a real problem with the way smart cities are are sold. Um, it's usually solving a problem that I didn't know existed and it probably doesn't exist. Um, we're kind of told that if we create this central, um, we, we saw the picture of it actually, this kind of command and control room with kind of, there's usually a mayor in the middle kind of going, do this and do that, and that's bullshit. But um, <laughs> the reality is there are some fundamental problems that we need to solve for in the now. Um, there are problems around logistics. We could, we could probably enable people to um, save energy. There's real kind of um, st uh, you know, data around the fact that people spend a lot of time look, uh, you know, looking for parking spaces. So you know, small things like, can we solve that problem? Can we, can we kind of make people use um, the services that they have efficiently? The problems we have right now are local authorities don't have much money. Um, can we can we kind of save money? Can we make the spaces better? Um, there is there is a, a, a kind of a stat around um, air quality, for example. Children that live or grow up, I think, by the age of if I can remember the the numbers might be a bit made up, but like it's it's true. <laughs> um, just, just it's an anecdote. But like, if you uh, by the age of ten, if if children live around um, major A roads and and motorways, um, their lung capacity by the age of ten is significantly decreased. Um, so there is like a, t a, a twenty percent or something. I mean, there th that is a fairly huge number. And if you, we should. If you plant some trees in between the kind of the houses that they live in and and the motorway, you kind of you are uh, you make a great impact. But you can only do this if you have the data. If you have the data, if you can take the data, you can take the data from the NHS and and really kind of uh, create some you know kind of outcomes. And um, and and I, I know that I I'm I'm a computer scientist and I'm I I'm, I always think that you know uh, data and systems are going to solve problems, but generally they won't solve all the problems, but there, there are some kind of significant things that we, we can do. And also, this is, this is the reality. We had, um, we, had, we had a process where we were trying to help Westminster Council with parking data and, and footfall data. 
It was the most interesting thing I've ever... I came out of um, the private sector and I thought things were really, really inefficient. And we said, OK, let's get your parking data. Um, it won't be real time, fine. But let's, let's, uh, let's, let's get it and let's see what kind of analysis we can do around it. And it took three months. And this is the kind of... It went through about seven or eight different companies. Um, I live in East London, Westminster is West London, obviously, and I said, I will come and get it off you, please just give me the data. And they couldn't, they couldn't access the data, right? This is, this is services, I mean, forget about future cities, let's kind of, let's solve the problems that they have now, which is they can't access the data, right? Um, they have weird contracts, outsourcing that nobody really understands, Westminster whole data on parking, TfL whole data around um, uh, traffic flows, some private company holds data on footfall. This is madness and it costs us millions and if we can find ways to simplify it, forget the futuristic kind of Jetsons feel, that would, be, that would be amazing and it will save millions and it will actually also make, um, sit, I mean, it's not just about cities, it's, it's, it's also kind of, it's, it's the whole country a nicer place to live. Um, so this is what we're trying to solve. We say to kind of um, uh, councils and, and, and everyone else, just, we've, we've solved this with the web. Jesus is a web, REST API, um, put it somewhere and let, internally let like, kind of provide you reuse and and hopefully externally this if it's public data let other people create services because you can't afford to create uh, the services that you need um so uh, this is me uh, <laughs> i don't care about future cities or smart cities or whatever you call it i i have there are some really tangible problems that we can uh we can solve today um and 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 i hope to see kind of more and more of this letting go of, of control and, and um, I mean, I, I'll say this, that I think the local authorities especially are very keen to open up their data. They're not, um, they're not against it at all. There is, there is two problems. One, they don't know how because they don't have the, the systems in place. They all are still using um, CSVs and, and, and so on. So actually, if, if something doesn't fit into, into a CSV, they are kind of scuppered. So there is a real technological problem, and, a, and I don't know why, because, you know, kind of, we are, we are going leaps ahead in, in, in other areas, but they seem to have a real access problem. Um, and then the, and another thing is, there is a real kind of fear of what will happen with data. So in terms of legally, nobody wants to end up in the front page of the Daily Mail. So there is a sense of, oh, what's going to happen with our data? But I, th I think there is, the g there is a general one in it. So they're, kind of, they're, not the, they're not the villains in this piece at all. Um, there, is, there is a real kind of, um, there is a real will to, to, to you know, enable reuse. Uh, so the, the anecdote that I will say, a city that's got it right. If you're talking about uh, a smart city is, is, is Bristol. They've created uh, what's called Bristol's Open. And what they want to do is create a programmable city. So the city is paying for fiber optic cables and hardware and so on. They're opening the data. They're enabling other people to create services and, and, and create a, a kind of a marketplace around this. And I hope to see many other places uh, reflect this. They want people to work, play, and, and um, and, and really kind of grow, grow the city and let the city take its shape rather than kind of being predefined. So uh, a programmable, agile city. Uh, there we are. So thank you very much. I'm Yoda Stanton. <laughs> Hello. Okay, I'm going to talk about some strange stuff. Um, I run a research institute and we design and evaluate human-centric technologies which combine the old school analog techniques and digital techniques. And we're looking at creating new spatial, spatial literacies. 
we're moving away from things like augmented reality to sensory augmentation and perceptual technology. And as Cedric Price says, technology is the answer, but what is the question? So the difference between smart cities and smart citizens, it seems that um, this is a definition from Dan Hill at Future Cities Catapult. He says that smart cities um, rely on the delivery of information to people who then change their attitudes and after that their behavior. Whereas the smart citizen idea is that your behavior changes first. So I'm going to concentrate on technologies that actually change your behavior and then as a result your attitudes change. So some of the stuff from the first category, uh, Safecast was a big project, um, a Fukushima hit. Um, obviously the government were lying to their public and this was a very big project from MIT where they, um, they got Geiger counters out to everyone as quickly as possible. Um, and they, they managed to get a very granular results of um, you know, radiation um, street by street so people could see um, outside their house how much radiation was occurring. So they combined that with medical data um, and they have the biggest, they had the biggest uh, project, citizen science project in the world. They still do, I believe, with this, this kind of data. It proved far more effective than expert opinion. We've also got the Smart Citizen Kit uh, that was kick funded. I mean, we've got this, again, available all over Europe, um, looking at things like sensors with temperature, humidity, CO2, etc. Uh, this is a project um, to stop people getting run over called the Dancing uh, Traffic Light. Um, an interesting one because it's actually a real person that's supplying the data to the traffic lights. Um, as opposed to that, um, we've got uh, Mon Mondeman's shared space traffic system where he advocated and actually implemented in the 80s the removal of all signs and rules from intersections instead relying on active human interaction to not crash into other people. So arguably this is the real active smart citizen. Uh, we've also got gamification uh, interventions in cities now, like this um, piano playing staircase, turning your city into a local gym. Um, this idea that in Taiwan they've, they've got dog owners um, being made, um, given lottery tickets if they actually uh, put their dog poo into bins, literally turning dog waste into gold, has halved the faecal pollution in the streets. Um, so without thoughtful, um, uh, th well, without thought, a lot of technologies are actually um, turning us into zombies. So we've got, we've already seen this sort of thing before tonight where it's a huge design problem. Kids today are, are losing their depth perception because they're constantly addicted to iPad 2D spaces. So in order to counteract, this is one of the things we've got in the lab, which is a 360 helmet. So it takes, this, it takes in a, a street, view hel uh, street view input and then squashes that into 180 degrees. So your brain only takes 15 minutes to adjust to seeing in 360. So unlike the Oculus, this seems to be a technology that actually doesn't cause nausea um, and could effectively solve the cyclist death problem um, because you're obviously able to see these blind spots. Uh, so obviously we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us. Uh, another one that could affect city um, construction, we've got a perceptual technology from MIT called the Ristify which effectively is your own personal air conditioning system. Uh, it's a perceptual piece of technology because it affects how hot or cold you think you are by manipulating parts of your body. That's what it looks like. Uh, so we've, we're seeing a, um, a situation where augmented technologies, um, even with your mobile device, this is, a, this is an old bit of um, computer vision technology called PTAMS, now called SLAM. Basically what this is doing is he's scanning his desk and the camera in his phone is actually making a 3D model on the fly of everything on the desk. Um, and this is what's coming to augmented reality generally. Uh, pro um, uh, Project Tango is an initiative by Google. They've started um, delivering these devices to developers and effectively they make 3D models of everything they see around them. This is what the device looks like. 
So effectively what we're going to see in the future, very near future, is we won't be taking pictures, we'll be taking 3D point clouds of everything we see. So what are we going to do with that data and how will it be useful for urban uh, design, etc. A project called Clay Vision is looking at exactly that, um, allowing you to um, collect your city in 3D models. Uh, obviously this links up with things like the Theatre of Memory, um, where the orators in Greece would, would actually uh, have a piece of virtual architecture in their heads, which they would then map their seven-hour speeches to that virtual architecture. So we're looking at an upgrade to that sort of system. So again, using your city to improve your memory. Uh, Google Glass is having a bit of a bad rap, but it's not going to go away. It's just going to transform into something else. But this idea that even with your Google Glass making 3D models of everything in front of you, um, you're going to get a situation where you can personalize your world. So if you don't like a building, you'll be able to delete it. Um, or if you don't like men, you'll be able to delete them and put whatever you want instead. So it's this idea of reimagining re what already exists using perspective to shape reality rather than changing reality itself. Obviously there are real dark, dark energies there as well, but I think this is a really important uh, thing to raise. Uh, improving navigation in cities. Uh, this is a brilliant project from the no longer existing Berg, a brilliant design house in London where they actually enabled uh, people to see the overview and the local view at the same time in their maps. Uh, and a nice idea from Gibson's wife, within one field of view to be both in the world and to see yourself in it. The power of looking through and occupying your own field of vision. Another project enabling uh, re reinvigorating naviga navigation and mitigating against the problems with GPS as we all know, GPS means you no longer get lost, which is terrible. So this idea is basically you've got um, a belt which enables you to feel where magnetic north is. If you wear the belt for three weeks, you have that as a new sense. So you're enable enabling new senses with, the, with these technologies. A project that I was involved with in Japan, um, improving the issue of obesity and the impact that has on the city. So this technology enables you to increase or decrease the size of your food whilst you eat it in order to trick your brain into thinking you're eating less or more food depending on whether you're obese or anorexic. Or, or, or these displays that are coming which will, will mean you no longer need to wear your glasses because the display will correct itself depending on your prescription. Uh, improving social lives in cities, a nice project from Berlin, uh, conversation specification I call it, where you, no matter what height you are, by the time you start talking to people you're all two metres tall. Um, brilliant project again from Barcelona, um, this idea of looking through someone else's body. And obviously again for urban designers it's quite an interesting project when you might want to look through a disabled person's perspective on the city on their access to that place. Um, these, these things are becoming very, um, very available. This is Google Cardboard, which is a $20 version of Oculus, the Oculus Rift. Um, and I like this one, which is the DIY VR, which hacked, hacked Google Cardboard and improved it and made it even cheaper and kickstarted it. Um, we've also got, very, very near the end, uh, 4D printing, this idea that we will use 3D printers, but then, depending on the context of use, this is actually in the sewer works in New York, um, depending on the flow of water, these objects change shape. So the 4D is the change in context, or what I call context engineering. So to summarize, obviously we think of technological solutions before defining the human need, so there's a great need to provide frameworks for interpreting the value and potential impact of these new technologies. Um, we've got a huge problem with outsourcing intelligence, cognitive offloading with things like GPS and spell checkers. Um, and fluidity of thinking relates to fluidity of movement. So I'm looking at using hybrid technologies to change the way we interact in cities, allowing us to access new ways of seeing and knowing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you. May I invite all the panelists uh, up here on the stage so we can start the conversations? And could I have uh, some muscle power to move the podium off the stage? James also has a BA in politics and a really good job, but sometimes he also has muscle power. <laughs> That was really interesting. I think that we have provided an excellent selection surrounding the argument of smart cities. I think we've seen all the different kinds of rhetorics. I would uh, summarize each of the conversations. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, maybe you can squeeze in a little. It's okay. We're not all British here, so <laughs> we'll be okay. So I think I'm, uh, uh, I'm going to leave it out for the questions. I don't think I will need to summarize the, the, the wonderful contributions of our speakers. But just to say that we had highlights of utopian as well as dystopian views, which are within the conversation of smart cities. We have seen different approaches on how to make your everyday life better through the wonderful kind of projects that we've shown, we've seen. Um, as, a, as, as being Greek, I will uh, turn my first question and, and go towards the, the uh, applications that we saw in Birmingham and, and what you said about the mixing of the bottom up with the top down that you all kind of touched on and, and discuss a little bit and, and each of you about the budget. You know, what kinds of budgets are required to produce the, the projects that you all shown us? Are they doable? What, what are the, 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 the organizations and funding bodies that one would look to, to fund the projects? I, I think that's a great question because it's, for me, the most absolutely fundamental one. I, I think I agree with a lot of what everyone here has said, which is, and I, I wrote this on my, my blog, just, just this last week in a post that's had more views than any other post that I've ever put up. If we leave this stuff to the market, we won't get the cities we want. That's just absolutely obvious to me. Um, the market is dominated by private sector organisations, and I, I don't view private sector organisations as bad, because, you know, a one-man band just trying to make a living every day, that's a private sector organisation. If we can't make a living, the whole country doesn't work. The challenge is that the structure of private sector organisations is literally amoral, and at the moment, all they're audited on, really, is financial performance. Um, unless we get regulation that, to Eva's point earlier, and I think to, to Rob's as well, really gets the right approach to personal data and gives us, as individuals, control over it, unless we get all sorts of other things right, then I don't think we get the cities that, that we want. I, I don't personally call a grid that gives all of the, all of the value to, to wealthy individuals or big companies. I don't call that a smart grid, not me personally. And the sort of grids that Rob was describing are small-scale ones that create local value that's smart to me. Um, challenges we don't have the planning policy, we don't have the regulations that make that sort of mo approach the most financially rewarding and the vast amount of investment in the world goes to the things that are the most financially rewarding. So that's what we need to change. That's a massive, massive challenge um, but people are looking at it. So one of the things that Birmingham City Council asked themselves a little while ago that was wonderfully forward looking was what about the smart city agenda means we should change planning planning policy. So now they put things into planning policy that promote things like open data and freely available connectivity. That means that when the next pension fund invests the next half a billion pounds in the next redevelopment scheme, some of that money will get spent on things that open up digital infrastructure for people. Uh, I think to I think it was Priya's point or it might have it might have been Rob's that gives people the best tech, not the best tools they need to change their own neighbourhood. So that, I think, is what we need to do. So where's the money coming from? Actually, the elephant in the room is that in this country, almost none of the money for these ideas is coming from sustainable sources. It's almost all coming from research and innovation funds like Innovate UK. It's great that we've got those things, but that's not going to make all our cities smart. So uh, what I really think we need is changes to policy about data, about planning policy, about the auditing of private sector corporations that change the way that investments are made so that it creates better outcomes for us all. This isn't new stuff. Jane Jacobs, who wrote the sort of fundamental book about how to understand cities based on the banal daily lives of, 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 of of the people who live in them. She wrote this stuff down in the 1960s. She was right then and she's still right now, but it's very difficult to do. 
Thank you. Priya, would you like to say something about you, the way your projects are funded? So um, my projects, like I said, uh, we are self-funded or we actually work with uh, the, either the brand city or uh, city authorities, the only time we got funding is from the Technology Strategy Board is first project we're going to start off with. So how I make money is I run a design studio, I work with technology uh, companies like consumer electronic companies and other uh, service providers and I actually work on platforms and products and Changeify itself charges for its events. So we've always um, made sure that because and the free is not really valued. And people also value the fact that we are putting up something there where it, it's organized and they can actually get their community project funded. So the last event that we ran in Hamburg, it cost us 1,500 euros. The money for that came from different sources. It came from the city itself, which uh, invited us. The local businesses put in some money to pitch the projects. So these are not massive uh, budgets, and you cannot make a business on this. And I think this is what's interesting. There are two. There's a positive and there's a negative. And going back to Rick's point, is what is the business model for smart cities? So if you're a developer, like right now we've got an API strategy where we are hoping to build our API and charge for the API, which is an application protocol interface in terms of the data. But people themselves can also now own their data and sell their data and make money from their own data if they have those marketplaces. So I think data is currently not seen by citizens as how they can monetize their own data because everybody else is monetizing your data. But once the power goes back to people and they're able to have better tools, then I think we'll see new kind of business models. And I think that's what's lacking and that's what I'm interested in. And we've been, uh, going back to Dr. Rick's point again, we've, we've been spending a lot of time in other cities also in the Bay Area, speaking to startups, speaking to one of the largest mobility companies there. And it's very interesting to see how in the Valley, the concept of data, which is not just one person owns it, but other people can also monetize it, which is you yourself, it, it gets quite interesting. And maybe more innovation needs to come from Europe on that. Yeah, most of my funding comes from uh, European funding. Um, they're all research projects. Um, and actually, there's huge amounts coming from Europe in the Horizon 2020 program, um, 70 billion. And a lot of it is applied research. A lot of it is creativity. Um, so there's big opportunities for these sorts of projects. Um, so the question was what, <coughs> you know, how big do the budgets need to be? And I think what was interesting about Priya and Yodit's points was that the budgets can be tiny and still have big impact if they have impact. And my worry is that although um, it was very inspiring to hear about um, Priya's uh, work in Germany where you're actually consulting locals and taking their views and trying to pass them back to those in power. And although I agreed with what Yodit said about um, individuals should be able to decide the degree of monitoring, health monitoring that they want, um, I don't think it's practical. It's not going to happen any time in the foreseeable future, stretching for 20 years. My brother actually works for the NHS, and his job is getting NHS groups to adopt new technology. So somebody comes up with a way of communicating, for example, between the hospitals who are trying to release people out and clear a bed, and social services you know, have got to take this person and look after them, now they're back in the community. And the problem is that nobody will adopt this technology, nobody will learn how to use this software. His job is to gently persuade them to use the software, so um, you know, that takes a number of months for a very small area to adopt one piece of software. And um, we've seen the way that local councils in Britain, I don't know about anywhere else, just will not listen to their voters, to their electorate. And whether you're sending them the information via cell phone or via letter, or via phone call, I, it's actually it's slightly easier to um, monitor response to a, a text or a tweet than it is to a letter. But uh, I think you can see where I'm coming from. The good thing about living off grid, of course, is that it's very low cost. You know, you haven't, you tend to live in a smaller house, use less energy, pay far less to the utility companies, if anything, and uh, pay very little in property tax either. Thanks. Um, so this is, oh, this is about 
So I'll, I'll go back to, I guess, smart cities, maybe software funding, and and that's my area of expertise. Um, I think I, 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 I think we're kind of looking. Um, so we we charge for basically privacy people that want to pay, pay uh, uh, connect uh, products in private could just they just pay us a low fee. Um, I think there's a general point around um, how we actually pay for smart cities, and I and I and I come. I'm a, a big uh, lover of the open source movement and and free software, and um, government digital services in the UK, which is uh, central government, have are really the world leaders uh, on this side. All of the the central government services, the cabinet office, and and so on, are on GitHub. So you can see their code, you can fork it, and I think building smart cities in that way um, is, to me, the way forward. I mean, uh, you, we, it's it, none of the advanced um, technology companies touch proprietary databases anymore because the database provider goes out of business and then you're stuffed because you're kind of left holding this tank. And I think if we're gonna if we're gonna really kind of push the boundaries, we should. Think about how we can we can do this. So if you build something for London or Hackney or whatever, then you know Rio should take it really and and fork the code and and um, create their own services. And that's how you make it cheaper. I mean, we have really we've kind of solved this problem of making software really cheap um, and and developers and 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 and, and designers creating um, taking a small part of of the value, um, but actually creating something that is much more valuable than um, than they take out. Um, so I truly believe that if if we have a policy, I mean the government digital services have a policy of trying to make a lot of their code open source. Um, I know of uh, even the tax office is on GitHub now. Um, the White House is on GitHub. So we have, I mean, we, we are doing this. We're kind of, we are, we are, um, we just kind of need to adopt it in, in, a, in a different way and just move away from um, a, and a local authority can then choose to pay for uh, a private proprietary service and that's their choice that's fine or an open source service or um, so I mean again I'm, I'm I, I come out of the, the the school of give people choices um, we our IOT uh, network is open source so if they if people want to run their own IOT service great uh, Go do it because and contribute to our code because it makes our service better. So, um, you know, we're kind of we need to move a bit faster, and I'm quite impatient, and I want to see stuff happening in my lifetime rather than you know for for some kind of thirty thirty or well, whatever, a few generations from now. So, um, and that's that's my outlook. Um. Okay, that's great. Uh, now is the time we can finally take questions from the audience. Yes, it was you there. Yeah. Hello, my name's Ian Simpson from uh, Middlesex Independent Campaigner in, a, in another area. So this, this area is relatively new to me, but I had a, a, some comments which i like feedback on. Um, smart, self-monitoring and reporting technology. Um, there's no doubt that the potential of uh, apps and, and all this technology discussed tonight has some amazing benefits for community if it's run by the right people and with the right intentions. Uh, the problem is is that when, you, when you're dealing with um, corporate entities and government, and I have little distinction between the two, um, the potential for removing all anonymity and freedom and monitoring every aspect of our life, increasing control and anxiety, etc., etc., is, uh, is evident. Um, I, I kind of liken uh, some of these smart meters and, and other technologies monitoring, you know, how much television we watch and, and, you know, the temperature of our fridge and the time we use our gas and kettle and everything else to having... Uh, a bunch of parking wardens, um, you know, sat around our house with clipboards, um, and it's it's not too dissimilar, really. And when we look at how parking wardens have behaved over the last 20 years, you know, uh, there's there's every chance that the companies that operate these systems will will adopt a very similar approach, which is um, essentially just to abuse you financially. Um, 
Uh, there's also the potential to undermine community um, and freedoms generally and uh, the potential eventually for being off-grid and not participating in this technology um, eventually becoming illegal um, and uh, people being fined for not participating in these systems uh, or um, charged more, etc. I think uh, smart meters is, is the current one really, the first of many I believe. Um, that they promise you benefits and um, there's no uh, disadvantages and yet uh, there are health problems which many report and also uh, most people report that they don't save money at all. So, so what is the true intention behind them? And, and I think that could be rolled out over the technology generally uh, when we're dealing with corporates. Um, and as a general statement, I think it's important to, to remind ourselves that we don't need any of this. You know, and and we should be very wary generally. So yeah, thank you. That was more of a contribution than a question, but I wonder if our panelists would like to respond. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I mean, I work for a corporation, a very big one. I've spent 20 years working for very big corporations, and I don't want any of the negative things that you've just described to happen. Um, nor do any of the people that I've ever known working in any of them. Now, um, there are a couple of corporations who are advising a few things under the name of algorithmic regulation at the moment who are perhaps um, driving down those sorts of routes. I don't personally agree with them, but I think they're in a minority. Um, so I think this actually comes back to my, my previous points. Um, we need to have a discussion about what we as people want for our future. And most of the people I talk about in corporations, in councils, in government, want better social mobility. They want healthier people. They want a better chance for children. All of those things. The question is, how do we adjust the financial and regulatory environment to achieve that? So, you know, do we get a smart grid where all of the benefit goes to the big corporations, all of the benefit goes to the shareholders, or do we get a smart grid which allows people locally to use local energy sources to share them um, and to trade for their own benefit when they've got a surplus? Um, you know, both of those things are entirely possible with technology. Actually, we do need some of this stuff because, for example, um, the United Nations estimate that by 2050 with 2 billion more people living on the planet 3 billion more people having the affluence to afford a middle class lifestyle and hence meeting, eating more meat we need to be putting about twice as much food on the world's plate as we're doing at the moment the current system we use to produce food uses 75% of the world's fresh water and the amount of fresh water available to us is falling so if we don't change, we're going to run out of food. Simple as that. So we do need ways to change. Um, we've got to have a grown-up conversation, I think, about the sort of world that we want and how we then turn that into the policies and regulations that shape the investments into this stuff that will happen because it will make money. We have to turn that process of making money from this stuff into something that's not a contradiction to people having better lives. I, th I think we won't get that unless we change the way that things work. I think the key point there is that you're forcing the responsibility on the individual, whereas the responsibility should lie with government and corporations to manage systems, not the individual. And therein lies the problem from a conspiratorial point of view. You're basically saying, you need to worry about this, and we need to monitor you and pressure you. And government should be controlling those systems, no, not us. So, so I spend a lot of my time writing a blog, going to industry forums, I'm a member of the government's Smart City Forum, I advocate this stuff all the time. So I take it as my responsibility as an employee of an organisation that's got enough money to allow me to spend time doing those things which I don't then get paid for. Um, advocating exactly these things. I've written down, so I take responsibility for it as an employee of a corporation and I ask our government, both at national and local level, to take responsibility for it. The British Standards Institute has just published a set of guidelines for how to amend planning policy to achieve some of these things. That piece of work got done because I argued with them that they should do it. They weren't going to do it initially and I gave them the source material that I worked on for Birmingham City Council free of charge without telling my employer I was doing it at the time. Right, So I'm putting my money where, I, where my mouth is. Um, we do have to have the corporations and government take responsibility for this stuff but corporation and government are made up of individuals. You know, all of our choices as to what we spend our time on um, and what we advocate 
Okay. And so, you know, I agree with you. I don't want the dystopian end point that I agree is possible and that you've just described. And I'm personally doing everything I can through a corporation with government to achieve that. Hi, thanks everybody for the presentations. Um, I had a question for, for Nick. I really enjoyed your uh, kind of archaeology of, of the energy grid, let's say. Um, I wanted to know maybe a little bit more uh, about, uh, let's say, data grids, because the two things in a way are, they go hand in hand. And uh, the, for as much as we can uh, assume that uh, you know, energy production can become localized and therefore off-grid, um, I wanted to know maybe your thoughts about you know, data as, as a grid and how you essentially uh, regulate that as a, potentially as a utility or as a commodity itself. Yeah, um, I think it's pretty clear now that data is taking the place of electricity and that uh, you know, perhaps in the not too distant future all server farms will be located next to nuclear power stations and you know everything else will be catered for with a solar panel on your roof and um, I you know obviously it's not possible to go off all the grids all the time however hard you try you're still likely to need to go to a hospital or use a bank or you know even if you don't do those two things there'll be something else and it might very well be your cell phone or your smartphone and I like to tell myself that I'm off the grid but on the cloud but I know that really I'm on the grid and uh, you know there is a chance that a different you know sort of alternative internet will emerge and when I first got excited about the internet I was the first journalist in London to write about the internet and I remember there was a um, what the papers say one time and ask who is this guy who's written six articles for six different national newspapers in the last week one saying the internet's a pawn then one saying it's the future of everything and so on. and at the time i was so excited that this was a true leveler that was going to hand power back from the corporation to the individual and you know it was briefly like that but now of course the power balance has shifted right back the other way and my hope is that some kind of citizen's internet could still emerge um, you know, through places like Hackspace and through the hacker movement. It's not really an answer to your question, but it's a few notes. This is a question for Nick. Um, when you talk about off-grid, I think about Detroit as being a city which has an absence of grids and a lot less top-down than there is in other places, and perhaps it's an example of many um, decayed cities. But I wondered if you'd spent time there and whether there are any lessons that could be learnt um, from a city which is, is being built up bottom-up, and particularly your point about budgets can be tiny and have impact, and whether you've seen anything there if it's a city you visited. I haven't been to Detroit, but there are parts of Miami which are quite like that. And I have spent time in Miami where, and it is very interesting because obviously when you think of off-grid, you think mainly of rural areas. Uh, so off-grid in the city is quite unusual and very instructive. So large parts of the London Canal system now house tens of thousands of people off the grid. Um, providing their own water and energy. Obviously, you can also you know, pay extra to hook in. Um, and there are parts of Miami, whole blocks of Miami now, which have been kind of colonized by homeless, and there are sort of tent cities on the edge of a lot of American towns. Um, and some of them don't work. You know, they've become places for people with problems and, and um, elite, you know, and criminals. Um, so no, I don't know about the Detroit situation, and, but I do know that some of them do work and uh, have their own micro-economies, have their own energy supplies, uh, 
uh, and in effect trade what goods they produce with you know the rest of the nearby community. Uh, talking about Detroit, um, I'm originally from Mumbai, and if you go to, I don't know how many of you guys have uh, heard about Dharavi, which is one of the largest slums, it's similar to Kibera, I was living in Kenya as well. And I think it's actually quite interesting to look at inner cities of cities where people are, again, having these kind of almost battle-like systems or taking also sometimes cheekily, you know, taking uh, the electricity or uh, stealing electricity from the actual grid itself and running their own generators and running alternative economies. And I think one thing I want to say here, and this might sound a bit challenging, but I think oh, when we're designing these kind of systems, we shouldn't assume that everybody wants to do something for good. We should actually appeal for people's selfishness as well. And a lot of software currently, there's an assumption that you put an app out there, you put a system out there, whether it's open source or open data, there's an assumption that people will start using it because it's got like social good or tech for good. And actually people don't care unless the user experience is really there. So it's a bit like veganism, you know, we all want to say, let's stop eating meat, we all have to be good. But ultimately people are not going to do these things unless you make it really compelling and desirable. So I have problems when people assume that with all these things sounds very lovely jubbly and Ethiopia and you're going to be living off grid, but ultimately everybody has a selfish reason to do something like that. It's a lifestyle choice, it could be an economic choice, it could be a way your system is set up. And I think we have to be a bit careful when we just blanket these things with some kind of moral values as well. I've seen some interesting analogies again in, in town planning and architecture. So Kelvin Campbell, who created the um, Smart Urbanism Massive Small Movement that I've talked about a little bit, has spent time looking at um, r very rapidly growing cities in developing nations where just the sheer volume of people moving towards cities is way beyond the country's ability to build infrastructure or put governance in place. Um, so obviously usually the result of that is just slums. Um, but a lot of the economies of slums self-organise in some ways quite effectively. So what they're, they're looking at doing is how can you put a very basic infrastructure in place that uh, then allows the the slum to grow but in a more healthy way than it would otherwise but doesn't interfere too much with its ability to create its own value and so that there have been projects where they put in grid systems of pathways and drainage ditches party walls that regulate regulated interviews etc and then the slum grows with just slightly more structure slightly more infrastructure there so it's a better quality experience without being a highly regulated one and I think that you know question of how you balance informal and, and formal is one that we really need to get to grips with. And even though I was just thinking about the data itself, so talking about your data point, there is obviously things like Ethereum. So Vinay Gupta has been speaking about Ethereum, which is based on Bitcoin and using the blockchain as a new way of trying to create a new system. So there's some very interesting things happening out there. We have things like Parrot Box as well. We use that in a project where you can create your own local network. It doesn't have to use Facebook or Twitter. The, again, going back to Nick's point, many of these uh, bottom-up things are quite artisanal or quite craft-like and probably only hackers will be using it. And I think for us, again, as designers and developers, that's what Yodit's trying to do with the Open Census platform as well, is make this much more accessible so a lot of other people can participate. It doesn't become just a hobby activity. Could we take one or two more questions so we have enough time at the bar? <laughs> So, Eva, yes. Yeah, just, just a quick question for uh, Priya, I guess. Uh, one thing which I'm just finding really hard to accept, that we're still talking about cities and accepting that they have to grow. You know, I feel personally ill when I look at London and, and I look what's happening to it and we're becoming slaves in our own city. It's all going up and up and privatization of the air, which Guardian put so nicely this week. It's unnecessary. You know, it is absolutely unnecessary what we're doing. So for me, the smart city is the distributed city. You know, I want to live in East Anglia on the sea and fish and be on the fantastic broadband and be able to be surrounded virtually with my working team. And, you know, I can do it because if I spend enough money today and I've dragged the bloody fiber to East Anglia, I can do it today. But what makes me ill when I look at BT bidding for some stupid sports ride that fucking nobody's interested in, apart from the boys, uh, instead of spending money on what they should be spending money, which is putting fiber everywhere, 
where we can have distributed city, we can have it in the virtuality, but physically, we really should be sitting somewhere nice and green. So I'm a little bit worried about our debate that we're sitting here like a kind of, you know, lost sheep, thinking, mm, you know, big city, we've got to cope. No, we don't have to cope with it. You know, the much bigger, much more interesting answer for me is how we get the fuck out of here. <laughs> 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 I think that's a great one. Um, I think London is already uh, getting distributed. So if you think about this project, which is saying London is changing um, by a project from Central St. Martins, where they're using the hoardings to talk about various anecdotes from London as already moving out of London. I think economically, it's very few. It's, it's going to happen, which is unfortunate. It's not planned design or planning like what we wanted to do. But I also think the broadband strategy, in terms of the last mile, if you look at the postcode lottery with broadband, especially in rural areas as well, and talking again about BT, it's amazing that you know right now, if London broadband sucks so badly, and we're supposed to be in the Silicon Roundabout and all, can you imagine? I think the I think UK in general. I mean, having worked also in other countries, like being in Seoul and being in India, I think you have a huge infrastructure issue, and I think that's the big elephant in the room after the business model for smart cities. I mean, if we still have taps which pour like hot water and cold water, and we can't even get that right after so many years of plumbing, I really worry. Like talking about protocols. You know, we, we haven't got a good history here. So I, I think we should be actually quite humble and look at countries which have actually managed to get the basics, going back to Yodit's point, the basics right, before pretending we can try and teach the world on how to do things. So I think learning from other um, countries and trying to also look at alternative kinds of systems like the distributed city that you mentioned, we already have those kind of communities living in Scandinavia, living in, in Holland. So there are these examples. I think the problem is in UK. It's not a world problem. Sorry, that's my opinion. Um, I don't have a strong personal view on this, this one either way. Actually, I personally like living in a city, but I like living in Birmingham and have never wanted to live in London because I find it too much, but that's a personal choice. Um, I, I think there are a lot of factors that are driving urbanisation that would be very difficult to change. Um, so Professor Geoffrey West, who was a physicist initially, studied the systems of cities and, and, and their metrics and found that basically value creation scales non-linearly with city size. You know, bigger cities create more value more quickly and more cost effectively than smaller cities. That drags more people to them for a better life, etc. No, it, that, the size of the city absolutely drives value, but not for people. Mm. You know, people's happiness is in inverse relationship to the size right. of the city. There's no doubt about it. Okay. So, so So, so th that, that's as may be, but people still get keep getting drawn to cities. Every study has shown that they're growing. Um, there, there is also a resilience argument, and I think you could balance that, you know, take that either way. You know, do we get resilience by scaling down, going off grid, having houses that, that generate their own, own energy? Is it perfectly possible for them to do? Or do we get a more resilient society through walkable cities where everyone's closer to each other and transactions are local. Again, I think you could go down either of those two directions, but at the moment, what the drivers are doing is pushing people into cities. I think you know one of the things that could change them is great adoption of social media, virtual technologies that allow us all to collaborate and create value in a different way. Um, but again, back I think to some of Rob's points, there are loads of us in this room who are voracious adopters of working in that way. There's an awful lot of other people in the world who still don't do things that way. And so, you know, again, I'm not trying to make value judgments. I'm just trying to describe a set of trends and drivers that I see. But at the moment, the bulk of the drivers are pushing towards bigger cities. Right or wrong, I think that's what's happening. If we decide we want something different, I think we'll have to work very hard at it. Actually, the uh, fastest growing population, interesting enough, from a very small base is exurbia. It's, it's not the cities, it's not the suburbs, it's not even the countryside, it's quite distant countryside. That's the f where the population is moving the fastest, from a small base. And the reason for that is, of course, the cell phone. So I don't think you need to worry about the fiber ever. It'll be, you know, very good 4G or 5G phones that will um, free us from the city uh, and are currently freeing us from the city. And, you know, I used to go to my mountaintop in Mallorca to get away from all that. 
and now I've got 4G on the mountaintop so I can actually run my website from there. Uh, my question is about human ecosystems. So it's uh, the idea that a lot of what people value are um, ecologically structured um, civilizations and or organizations that are bounded, small is beautiful, by um, some sort of restraint on the flow of uh, conversation, on information, or what have you. So. When you get diversity in the ocean, it's around a, a coral reef. I mean, it's because the architecture of coral it spatially prevents information flowing from one place in the ocean to another. So you get hunters and you get hunted, you get diversity creation. There's been a quite a few uh, good points made that architects study this, or very, very few architects, very special architects, and quite a good few points coming from both the audience and the panel about how markets tend to destroy that diversity in those ecosystems that we value. But very few people seem to be making that analogy to do with data and open data and sensors. I remember as well the beginning of the internet when, when big companies after the first idealism and these idealistic phases of revolutions tend to last three, four years before money spots it and markets come in and they commercialize it, started to sell PCs and CD-ROMs and hype and dot-com. It feels very similar now with universities being funded through smart city programs. It's quite clear what industry is trying to fund and how they'll make money. And it's quite clear how that data and the market system can a result in a centralization of these things which destroys human ecosystems. It is also quite clear that we have some of the techniques that don't just come from bottom-up groups meeting as they've always met and suffered the Roman army or the other hierarchical systems that destroy their natural ecosystems, that we have now some of the tools that we can use. Um, uh, and I think the key tool that we can use is law. Law is the thing in an information age, which is a language that if we start to reclaim, we can start to create richer, diverse, and non-centralized systems. And some of this cryptographic Ethereum type stuff can help with that, as well as our ability to reclaim and craft law for ourselves. But not big data, not open data, not, not um, even open source. These are things that are very easily reclaimed by markets. Can I say something? Um, so yeah, I agree with a lot of that, and, and you can see this, you know, the diversity being squeezed out of our city of London right now. There was a, a TV documentary about Mayfair a couple of nights ago, which showed how all the independent shops are being squeezed out of Mayfair, and I can, I can, I'm interested in your analogy with data, and I wonder it's worth exploring. How will the uh, universality of data squeeze our diversity. I, I can't quite see it, but I've got a nasty feeling you're right. I'll just very briefly say that I think your point about law is, is absolutely right. The law is not keeping up with what technology is doing. It's not keeping up with what the market's doing, which is, you know, a lot of the points I've been saying about inevitability are driven by market factors. I completely agree with your language. If we can reclaim the law, express the cities and the world that we want, whatever flavour of the things we've talked about, what, what it is, that's what we need to do to shape the investment flows that will happen to achieve what we want. That's what we haven't done yet. Uh, again, I sometimes wonder, I shouldn't have trained as a designer, but I've really signed up for a legal course because the kind of things you do as a designer, you end up dealing more and more with policy and legalities, especially with some of the citizen stuff which challenges government-based uh, thinking. And um, I think overall, I mean, the whole data element as well, we spoke about the coral reef. I was just thinking, going back to the Mayfair example, and also thinking about how slime mold moves as well. So maybe there is something happening naturally, but we are we're seeing it, but we're not able to articulate it. Is if people are buying Richard Power, people are buying these uh, 
parts of London from outside their external investors or there's people coming from uh, Middle East buying the super expensive places from Candy Brothers and suddenly you get this kind of anodyne experience where that, that whole space of Mayfair and Bulgaria just becomes pretty horrible and suddenly all the interesting people move away to somewhere else which is actually quite nice. So if you think about slime mold as well or you know when things you automatically sense this is pretty crappy you want to move away somewhere else maybe there's a way that London as a city would not be zone one zone two but probably zone six zone seven and zone eight becomes really interesting and suddenly you see a very different city emerge through a natural kind of you know progression. Um, I, I actually totally agree with you regarding the law. I mean, um, I'm, I kind of, I, I despair at uh, software developers, especially not engaging with the legal system and not educating the legal system. I think there is there is a real sense of that is not what we do necessarily. We'll kind of let them sort it out. I mean, there is, there is a huge, I, I attribute a lot of things to, to incompetence. So there is a huge level of um, kind of, gap between the knowledge, for example, how you anonymize data. Like politicians have no idea how to anonymize data. They talk about, oh yeah, 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 we're gonna release NHS data and it's gonna be anonymized. And we they they mean we're just gonna check you know, we're we're gonna take out the names and not not all the other details. Whereas, you know, there are probably in this square mile a hundred startups around here that could uh, within about five minutes de anonymize most of that data. So the 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 kind of the sense that software developers should uh, from our side, should engage and and really push push the kind of for for better for better implied consent is 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 the big thing like um, Priya was saying around you know when your toothbrush gets uh, the terms of service like uh, we we really can't say well it was buried deep in in, in the terms and conditions I think there there needs to be a law that says there is uh, there this is the basic uh, that expectation and not leave companies that are you know startups and and other companies that are vc funded to to really um make these decisions because they they really won't make it to the benefit of of consumers um so and that is the reality and if we recognize that we can we can we can kind of uh, create a basic i mean there is a movement right now to, to create a basic bill of rights around data and um, I don't know how far I'll get, but I, I know there, there, there are fairly some strong propositions going. So um, I think if we engage in it and if we can get people to, to engage in it, we, 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 again, I'm a natural optimist, so I, I'm optimistic that this is, this is um, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll go in the right direction. So. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. And on that point, on data normalization, which I think is the question of the now, and the, the, the digital citizen rights, which we are also involved in. Please check our websites for upcoming developments. I would like to thank our fantastic panel of speakers who gave us really wonderful insights on the smart cities argument. So let's a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you everyone for coming. Please make your way to the bar and our panelists will be available for questions and socializing. Thank you for coming. <laughs>